Coming up on this week's Outdoor Elements. We're here in South Bend at the Century Center, which is host to this year's National Association for Interpretation Great Lakes Region Workshop. That's quite a mouthful. It is. Interpreters are folks just like you and me that work in parks or nature centers and help people learn about the natural history or cultural history of their site. And they've gathered here to share ideas and share inspiration and learn from each other a little bit. We're going to chat with a couple of the presenters. We're going to learn about turtles and salamanders and how they swim. We're going to explore the St. Joseph River and look for some uh, ways that we can monitor and keep the river healthy. But first, we'll learn all about those wonderful summer insects that we call fireflies. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. One of the sessions here at the conference for park interpreters from around the Great Lakes region is all about a specific kind of insect and we are going to learn about fireflies slash lightning bugs with Bob Dispenza from Allen County Parks. Lightning bugs, fireflies, are they the same? The, that's a common term for them that most people use and we try and get them to be a little uh, more anatomically correct by calling them lightning beetles. Lightning beetles. They are actually beetles, flies or something else, bugs or something else. People use bugs as a generic term, but these are actually beetles, which is probably the most common kind of animal on the planet. Wow. Are. And speaking of, there's quite a few kinds of lightning beetles, right? There's about 1,900 worldwide. Wow. There's about 170 in this country, and Indiana has over 40 of them. Different species, kinds. different species different kinds of, of lightning beetles. And one in particular is very famous in Indiana. What's that? That's the Say's firefly, named after the great naturalist Thomas Say. It is the state insect of Indiana now. Yay, and that just happened like in just 2017 or 2018 recent, or so. Yeah, so that's very exciting. Beetles have um, hard wing covers, right? Yes, Over... they can crawl into small spaces and not damage their wings. Because of that hard cover. What people know about lightning beetles or fireflies is they light up, but they don't all light up, do they? There's a few kinds that don't light up at all. There's a few kinds that when they first emerge, they can put a little bit of light out and then they stop being able to. But that's the minority. Most of them have some kind of light emitting organ somewhere and they use it for very specific purposes. And we're going to talk about that because you have some great images about what we refer to as their flash patterns, right? Correct. So what is a flash pattern? Flash pattern is how they communicate with each other. They don't use sounds like some insects do. Um, and they're out at night where bright colors aren't going to help much, but they use that the light emitting organ to flash to each other and communicate that way and it's mainly for a way for males and females to find each other. And do they individually have different patterns or by species or how does that work? There is some regional there's regional dialects to them. There are some <laughs> so that fun. have a little bit of different pattern even though they're the same species if they're from a different part of the country. Okay. But most of them are very specific to their species and there's a certain pattern that's a, there's a certain length of flash and a certain number of flashes and then there's a certain time period in between when the male flashes and the female returns the flash. It's really complex, so it is, actually. <laughs> and, and they have it timed very closely, so they, and, they know. And why did it, so why, I know you said it's for, you know, males and females, but why would they have different patterns? Why would they have different patterns? A lot of that is species differentiation. They don't okay. waste their time trying to pursue a species which is not the same as theirs. They, they wouldn't be compatible to mate with. Okay. Correct. So you and I have a couple of flashlights and this is something that literally families can do outside at night. It's kind of fun. We Sometimes we do this with our day campers on an overnight. We give them all these little flashlights. So tell us what we what some of the things that we can do. Well, the, the, one of the more common ones that we find in Indiana is what they call the J-stroke or the big dipper and it will have a flash pattern that goes like that. Literally down, okay, down, yeah. Down, they yeah. go down and then stop. 
It's okay. just a J stroke, that's all. And then after a certain very defined piece of time, the female will just flash a flash back. And it's a, a, a certain amount length of time and it's a certain time after the J stroke finishes. Okay. And that way the male you can actually attract males to you by doing it at the right time. They will start flying closer and doing more. And as they get closer and closer, some of them will change the flash pattern a little bit. Uh, it'll be shorter or uh, they, well, they excited. have very, yeah, they do. <laughs> they, excited. they kind of say, I'm zeroing in on this. And it's very important that they find a female because for most lightning beetle species, the males outnumber the females 50 to one. Oh my gosh. And so the first wow. one there who gets to the female gets the opportunity <laughs> and the rest are just flashing out in the field, not accomplishing anything in particular, except you know, us seeing them, and that's good too. Which is nice, because it's all about the summer evening. I want to try this. So the males do the J, and the female The females are just a flash back. Okay, I'm going to be the female, you be the male. So okay, I, 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 okay, so J, and then literally, I just flash once? Yep. Like that. Like that. Okay. Yep. That would bring the, the males closer. It has to be awesome. Out. And we have a, a graphic that shows how long the male's flash is, and then how long you wait, and then how long the female's flash is. So you can really you can time imitate it really well. And the closer you are to that timing, the more the males are interested. So if you did, you, literally you could do this with a flashlight and the fireflies might come yes, closer yes, at night, which would. is really fun. Um, in terms of the role that fireflies play in the ecosystem, what do they do? As larvae, they are big consumers of things that don't get eaten a lot, like snails and slugs mm. and other small insect larvae. And they live, as larvae, a lot of them live in wet places. Not necessarily flooded, but, but damp soils. And those areas are very sensitive to pollution, disturbance, things like that. And there are some species where the females are completely flightless. So if you go into an area where they are, where they live, and you bulldoze the area and develop it, the females can't fly to a new place. They're flightless. And so you basically wiped out that area of those oh. particular species. And it happens in some places. Uh huh. Interesting. You mentioned the larva. <coughs> the larva are, are small and kind of nondescript. They look, yeah, they're, they're very well camouflaged. Yeah. And a lot of times the way we find them is on night hikes we go out and they will, there'll be two little flash points next to the trail. Usually there's two um, right next to each other, very dim. And if you don't have your night vision, you can't really see them. But when you find them, you zero in and get your flashlight on them. And you find this little brown thing that matches in with their soil very well. And they don't have any wings and they don't have any pattern to them to speak of. And so mainly it's the light that gives them away. And so the larvae themselves also emit light. What is the so mechanism? So do the eggs and, and the pupa. So the, oh, All okay. life stages will. That's amazing. What is the mechanism that generates the light? There's a couple of chemicals. Luciferin is the production chemical and luciferase is the enzyme that processes it. And in the presence of oxygen, those two will really act with each other and produce a very efficient light. It's like 98% efficient. And, um, and it's a cold light. It doesn't give off heat. No That's heat. why it's so efficient. So it doesn't use a lot of the insect's energy yep. also generating yep. heat. They, they, they are very efficient at processing it because it's very important to them and they have to do it a lot. And, and so <laughs> they, the more efficient it is, the less energy they use up doing it. And they will uh, produce this cold kind of greenish. There's some color variation yeah. depending on the species. Um, light that is, is mainly meant to attract the other kinds and the males also have a way around, uh, to compete with each other in some species there's a few of them have big flashy males that have a bright light and then the males of the same species that are smaller and faster Ooh. and so the big bright males go over and get the females to respond and then the males who are not so flashy and smaller they get their first zoom in sometimes yeah you know who knew there'd be so much drama on a summer night when the fireflies are out? But everything that you just shared helps us all appreciate lightning beetles so much more. So thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. One of the presentations that really caught my attention today was about salamanders and turtles. And a lot of times when we're studying wildlife, we think about things like what, what do they eat? Where do they live? But we're here today with Dr. Vanessa Young, who wants to tell us a little bit about some other things about wildlife, things that you study. So what are, what are some of the things that you're studying about salamanders and turtles? Well, um, by training, I'm a functional morphologist. So what I study is really how body shape responds to the physical properties of the environments in which these animals are living. So I uh, primarily look at differences in body shape between animals that live on land versus animals that live in water, as well as within animals that live 
in aquatic habitats, but in aquatic habitats that have different types of properties. Uh, Got it. Okay, so you have brought a couple of things for us to look at in, t in terms of talking about skeletons. This is a turtle skeleton, obviously, right? Yes. So why don't you talk us through that and then how that impacts the movement of the turtle. Well, turtles are really cool. They're really unique, and they're really, as far as vertebrates are concerned, they're really weird. Um, <laughs> and so the, the, the thing that makes turtles so unique is that they have this really characteristic uh, structure, and this is the shell. Yeah. If something has a shell like this, it's really easily identifiable as a turtle. Yeah. No mistake in that. Yep. <laughs> and so one of the things that, that we see when we look at turtle anatomy is that the shoulder girdle, so the, the shoulders and the pelvic girdle, the hips, are actually located inside the animal's rib cage. This is the only vertebrate that has this particular body form. Now in addition to that, what we see is that the spine is also fused to the top part of that shell. Sure. And this has really um, in, it, this, this has consequences for the ways in which these animals move. Okay, so my basic takeaway, this is pretty basic, but that means that spine is not flexible. Yep. That's right? exactly what that okay. means. So something else has to do the moving. Right, absolutely. So with turtles, what we see is that no matter what type of habitat they're living in, if they're walking on land, if they're swimming in water, all of that locomotor power is coming exclusively from their legs. This is different from what we see in other vertebrates that ah. can also use their body axis to move as well. Yeah, got it. Okay, all right, good enough. And on, uh, I, I want to point out too here specifically, I know that on a turtle, the feet, um, you know, they have those, uh, I guess, long toes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, there's often webbing between those toes, but you really are more looking at some other characteristics, including bones. Exactly. Right? And the shape of bones. And you've got an image, I think, about like the difference between terrestrial and aquatic species? Yes. So when we look at the shape of bones, the shape of bones really responds to the types of forces that act on those bones when these animals are moving in different types of habitats. And what we find is that in terrestrial animals, animals that are walking around on land, we have bones that tend to be round in cross-section. You can hmm. see here. And if we were to look in cross-section, they would look circular in yeah. shape. Yeah. But in aquatic animals like sea turtles, what we see is these tubular limbs or these round limbs tend to take on a more flattened morphology or more flattened shape. So you can see that in our sea turtle here, very broad if you huh. look at it from one aspect, but very narrow. So it gives that very flat cross-sectional shape, which you can see represented here. Okay. And so how does that help them? That's a great question. So on land, the types of strains or the types of loads that are applied to bones are often in a twisting motion. Um. And things that are round in cross-section can resist those twisting loads very, very well. Wow. Things that are flat don't. Things that are flat will fracture if a twisting load is applied. But when these animals move into water, that twisting matter. goes away. Right. Right. And so because that twisting goes away, these animals are no longer bound to maintaining that round cross-sectional shape, and they can evolve more flipper-like shapes that offer different advantages in the water, so they can use this flapping type wow. of locomotion to generate lift. Fascinating. Excellent. Okay, so if good. you're taking a look at the bones, you get a kind of good idea for, if you're looking at a species you don't know much about its habits, you can look at its bones and maybe get some idea of, okay, this is an aquatic turtle just by looking at the bones. That's yeah, pretty neat. That is really cool. So you study turtles. You also take a look at the movement of salamanders. Yes. So what do we have here? So what we have here is a dried specimen. This is a tiger salamander from the genus Ambystema. And so I brought this specimen today because this specimen really shows what we call lateral compression. So is this very narrow tail, but the tail is also very wide. And this gives a really nice surface area for pushing against that water during locomotion to generate thrust. So I'm gonna ask you a quick question because um, sometimes folks are, uh, they, they might see salamanders under logs, they might see salamanders crossing the road. But salamanders spend part of their time in water, and when do they normally do that? We should make that connection for folks. Well, some salamanders spend some of their time in water. So like the ambistomatids that I have here, they actually return to vernal pools during the spring. So these are these, these temporary pools after those spring rains, and they return there for breeding and for depositing egg masses. But there are other species of salamander, like the redback salamanders, that breed and deposit eggs terrestrially. So they still need to live in these moist habitats, but they don't go back to those stream habitats or those vernal pools in quite the same way that some other species do. So I'm do. guessing they're going to be a little different in the way they move. They are. Right. Um, I'm they're putting also this going together. Yeah, I'm figuring things out. They're also going to be a little bit different in their morphology in that they have tails that are round. So the redback salamanders don't have this lateral compression of the tail like we see in the abyssinatids. Okay, that's great. So if we look, if we see a salamander and it has a flattened tail, then likely it spends some of its life cycle 
in the water? Well, that was the idea. And so I have a student at St. Mary's, her name is Ellen Johnson, and she did her senior thesis actually looking at this exact question. Uh, so she did her summer work uh, this past year up at the uh, University of Notre Dame Environmental Research Center, UNDERC, in the UP. And what she was doing was she was looking at the tails and the swimming performance of blue-spotted salamanders, which belong to the same genus as our tiger salamander here, and she was comparing those to the red-back salamanders that have that round cross-sectional shape of the tail. Okay. How, how do you study such a thing? How do you look at that closely? You're not swimming around in a pond with a bunch of salamanders <laughs> up in a tail, so how do you go about looking at such a thing? So what we do is we collect animals from the field, and we take digital photos of them, and then we digitally measure their tail morphology or components of their tail morphology. So we measure the length, so the length of the tail from the cloaca to the tip of the tail. We should say what the cloaca is. Ah, that, yes, right? it's the vent right here. So this yep. is the single opening through which uh, reproductive and excretory waste exits the body. So we measure from, from the cloaca, it's also called the vent, to the tip of the tail to get tail length. We also measure tail height, which is this dimension here. Yeah. And then we take those two components and calculate tail area, which is the, the overall surface area of that tail surface. Wow, that's fascinating. And it's amazing, like, it's not the kind of things that I think of as a yeah. naturalist, right? I think about where, where do they eat, where do they live, how do they get around. But it reveals a lot. When you find tiger salamanders like this, and they're kind of chunky, I always think of them like tiger salamanders like Jabba the Hutt. Yeah. It makes, it makes <laughs> sense that they, would yeah. be, that they would be different now when you think about it in these terms. Right, that's great. <laughs> Fascinating. And so you have some video that uh, shows these moving around in the water a little bit. Can I you do. show that so to let us? Let me go ahead and click. I think that's a couple slides over. There we are. So these are some videos from Ellen's work this summer. And so what we have are the redbacks on the left here and the umbistema or the, the blue spotted salamanders on the right. And so after she measured these, these tail morphology characteristics, she built an artificial stream or she, she restored the artificial stream that was already up at Underk and she built this swimming lane. Um, and then she took video recordings of these salamanders swimming the length of the lane so she could calculate how fast they were swimming. And what she found was that the blue spotted salamanders, as their tail area got larger, they were actually swimming slower, which is the exact opposite of what we would expect. We would expect larger tail area, more surface to thrust right. against that water, right. should be swimming faster. We'll have to keep an eye out for this kind of stuff when we're out, you know, turning over logs looking for I salamanders know. or, you know, in a wetland checking these things out. I really appreciate you telling us about these things. I'm, it's definitely going to change the way I look at salamanders and, and, and turtles. turtles and turtles as we go out there. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So we just left the Century Center. We walked along the river to come down to a scenic area here. And I really love the St. Joseph River. I like to kayak out here. But the health of the river is something that has to be monitored pretty closely. We're here today with Matt Mearsman from the St. Joseph River Basin Commission. And he, you're, you do a lot of stuff related to the river's health. What, tell me about your work with the river's health. Yeah. The river basic was actually created to kind of keep a pulse on the St. Joseph River. And there's a number of different ways that one can go about knowing whether the river's healthy or not. And you know, one of the very first ways is just looking at how much water is flowing through the river. Yeah. So we've got gauges all throughout the drainage area that comes to the river, and uh, these gauges, you know, show how high it's going. But that's also interesting from a standpoint of after we have a big rain event, the faster, that to the, yeah, water, yeah. the faster it gets there, yeah. the worse off it is for the river. So we'd like to see it go up slow Slowly. and come down slow. That's so we I want the water to kind of infiltrate into the system a little more slowly so it's not bringing as much stuff and move th more slowly through the system. Exactly. Yeah. So, we, you know, although we can measure the flow or the hydrology of the river, one of the ways to really get a, a better picture of the overall health of the system is to look at what's living in it. That's so great. what's the biology? And that's one of my favorite things to do. And I know you've brought some nets today. Uh -huh. So we're going to walk in, get a little closer to the river, get these nets out and see if we can't see what's in there and see what that tells us about the river. So let's grab these nets and see what we can find. Sounds good. So I've done a little bit of this before because I was involved in the Hoosier River Watch before, and this is one of my favorite things to do, getting into the water with some nets like this and seeing what we can find under there. So let's uh, kind of wait in here a little bit and just see, maybe you, I think you spotted something that you can maybe investigate, see what's under there. So, so you grabbed a rock and sometimes when you pull some things up, there are things that were hiding under there that end up in our nets. So we'll explore around here a little bit, see what we can find. I'm going to try this vegetation over here. So I've got a scud. All right. So there's a little freshwater shrimp. 
Let's see if I can get him out where we can take a better look at him. Is that what that is? It's good. Looks like it. Now, one of the things I've heard is that it's based on, you know, how tolerant these things are of pollution. So if we find one that's fairly intolerant of pollution. That's a good sign. It's a good sign. Yeah, exactly. so if we only find things that can handle lots of pollution, that's, eh, that's not such a good right. thing. So we found a couple cool critters here that can tell us a, little, a few things. We found a scud and we found uh, what I think is a mayfly. So what does that tell us about the water quality? Yeah, well what we find is that the scuds are moderately tolerant to pollution. Okay. So you know you might find them in a stream like the St. Joe, yeah. but you're not going to find them in something that's really heavily polluted where there's no habitat left. Got so it's it. a fairly good sign. So that tells us this is not super polluted or they wouldn't be here. Exactly. And, and then it, the other one. that. Yeah, what we find on the other one is that that's a uh, mayfly nymph is what it looks like, which is even cooler because it says it's intolerant to pollution. So what we, that, that really should be your cleaner, You're not going to find many of those in a, a polluted stream. Exactly. Yeah, and, theoretically, at least. And one of the things I think that's important to keep in mind is that for bugs, there's a lot of different variables in, in the way of habitat, dissolved oxygen, uh, certainly chemicals and stuff that would affect their ability to live. But other things that us humans are tolerant of or intolerant of that doesn't bother them. And one of those, a big one in the St. Joe, is E. coli okay. bacteria. Uh, the bugs don't seem to mind the E. coli. So they don't necessarily tell us as much about that. So we have some other ways to testing those things. And you brought some equipment that, that uh, is used sometimes to monitor those exactly. things. So what can you show us with this equipment sure. that you brought well, here? Well, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned E. coli. And uh, I don't have an, uh, what we do is we would take a sample and we would take that to our partners at the local wastewater treatment plant and they would actually run a lab analysis on that. But there is some kind of cool things we can do in the field. One, to figure out the dissolved oxygen levels. We can also measure the phosphates or uh, nitrates. And where that gets interesting is if we don't find intolerant species and we know that uh, there's a problem here, you know, yeah. something is limiting these, these bugs' ability to live. So what is it? Exactly. Yeah. Then we can start kind of going further and saying, oh man, it looks like we have really high levels of phosphorus in, in terms of our lakes, we get algae growth and stuff like that. So the chemical analysis that we can do kind of allows us to more pinpoint what might be going on that's affecting the biology. Got it. So you look at all these indicators, kind of put them together to zero in on what the real true condition of the river is. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there's a number of different things that we would do all involve sort of, you know, getting a sample, adding a reagent or reactive agent to it, and then sort of seeing where it stacks up on the spectrum. You know, this is dissolved oxygen, which is pretty straightforward. All living things yeah. need yeah. dissolved yeah. oxygen. oxygen. Exactly. Yeah. So when we're factoring on all these things, they're caused by a lot of different things and people can help with some of these things. We can uh, maybe make the conditions a little bit better with some of our actions, you know, at a, at a level at home or at a broader level. What can you tell us about what people can do to yeah. help keep this river beautiful? You know, the exciting thing, we're finding some kind of intolerant stuff, which is yeah. really cool yeah. because um, a friend of ours that does a lot of work with us uh, is an aquatic biologist, samples fish out here in the river. He's done a lot of research historically yeah. and at one time there was probably only four to five species of fish that's in this river yeah, yeah, because it was so polluted. Now we're getting hundreds of different species. So that's species. another good sign. It's yeah. exciting. And you know, one of the things that uh, we think is a si why that's happening is because we have made changes and there's things that people are doing. You know, first it starts at the municipal level with our wastewater treatment plants. We're, we're not releasing raw sewage into the river except under extreme you events. Know South Bend here is doing some good things about monitoring that and it allows them to treat it in a little more focused way so they're exactly. doing good things with that. We're, we're really trying to hold on to everything we create and treat it before we discharge it to the river. So that's a big one. Also in our streets, it is something you don't think about. It's not sewage, 
but it's runoff. The water that when you, the rain falls, snow melts, it picks up oils, it picks up. Everything for, from your car and salt and all that exactly stuff. Exactly, yeah. carries it right to the river. Well, what we've been doing lately with the smart streets in South Bend is actually installing pervious pavers in a lot of places where it would have been asphalt. And those pervious pavers allow water to soak through and filter through the ground, recharge so the aquifer. So they don't just come straight into the river Doesn't with all the Doesn't come pollutants. straight into the Well, hopefully we'll continue to do all those things to keep the river and, and maybe make improvements on those things to make the river healthier, healthy as we go. I enjoy kayaking. I hope I get to enjoy it for a long time to come. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Thanks, man. Thanks, Fitz. It's been great being here at the conference to visit with park interpreters from Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. Yeah, I've got to see some old friends I haven't seen in a while. It was good to catch up with them. And I learned a lot. Yeah, it was great learning about the turtles and the salamanders and how their bodies kind of influence their mobility and moving through different environments. So that was great to see. And all about the lightning beetles and their flash patterns and why they flash and how they there's flash. There's a lot more to that than I think people will realize. There is. And exploring the St. Joseph River and learning about some of the tools they use to monitor the health of the river. That was great stuff. All good. Remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. We'll see you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at wnit.org backslash outdoor elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. But uh, it's really important, I think, for people to think about what they put on their yard yeah. and, and do a soil sample. Do a soil sample before you go to the hardware yeah. store and buy fertilizer because it may turn out that you don't even need fertilizer. And what happens when you put fertilizer on your yard and you don't really need it, it ends up here in the river. Outdoor Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.